Delmarva Today with Don Rush. Last year, 596 million chickens were raised on Delmarva, producing 4.4 billion pounds. The wholesale value, $5 billion, the most productive in the industry's history. You're listening to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. So, who are these poultry growers? who have been with us for some 100 years. Joanne Guilfoy has written a new book entitled Chickens on Delmarva, 100 Years of Backyard Flocks, Farms, and Friends. We have her in the studio this afternoon. Welcome to the program. Hi. Glad so, to be here. So what inspired you then to uh, to write this book? Plain and simple, it didn't exist. Had I been able to go to a bookstore or online and order it, I would have done that. It saved me a lot of trouble. Um, it seemed also that it was time for the story of Cecil Steele once again to be told as this year marks the 100th anniversary of her actually being credited with starting the broiler industry. Um, this book actually was finished two years ago. I ran into publisher troubles and some other troubles and then decided to keep going with it. Um, I did some other projects and then it just so it just worked out that this year 2023 was the year it was published. Why don't I turn to uh, Mrs. Steele? I guess you call uh, the marvelous Mrs. Steele, I guess, is uh, the uh, the characterization of her. Mm -hmm. 1923, mistake made in the order. Right. She um, was from Ocean View. Her husband, um, Wilmer, was at the time with the Coast Guard, and they had a very small kind of family operation farm, and she ordered 50 chicks to replace her layers. Um, she kept chickens for meat and eggs and in the old days and even up until when I was a young lady when you ordered chicks you got what was called a straight run that is 50% uh, males 50% females so she ordered 50 thinking that she'd keep 25 for laying and 25 to eat she was brought 500 from Steen's hatchery and just like then just like now you can't give them back so she raised them and her husband found her a piano box. First, they put him in the piano box, kind of like putting him in your basement, <laughs> or like I did my bedroom <laughs> in a box. Then they needed a, a shelter, so he built this kind of mini shed. Then they kept growing because she was very good at it, so he built her another shed and then another shed. Um, and again, these are freestanding, not connected. Um, and then she sold them for a very good price and decided to get some more go into the business so she great basically created what we now call the broiler industry because in 1923 because initially um these these hens and chickens and so on that they're lo looking at sort of table eggs i guess is what they were called right yes that and that is a phrase that refers to a grower who keeps hens simply for making eggs and selling eggs and that they either go to a restaurant or a food food producing company or they get you know, washed and then sold in the grocery store. The other, obviously, big family are the Purdue's. Tell me a little, a little bit about their origin. Well, they actually started, as I understand, more like 1920 and had many operations, not just chickens, but many other um, agricultural processes. And they were um, growing chickens for eggs, for meat, and it eventually, again, the 20s seemed to be a big time. Um, moved into primarily the meat producing business and it was arthur that started it and then frank continued and to me i mean he's as much a hero of the industry as cecil Steele because he went up to new york city and realized that there was quite a market he just had to corner it and he figured out that the jewish population the jewish community wanted yellow skinned chicken and he figured out how to do that and I will admit, I tried <laughs> the same thing with marigold petals, and but he he had a and it's, I'm sure it's a secret, um, a, 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 a recipe, right. um, and he won. He got, he got their attention. He got the market, and then that same year, 1923, Dupont Highway, thankfully from the Dupont family, was created. So then there was a roadway. There was a way to get the chickens to New York City. So it, we have the 1920s, um, Herbert Hoover and his, certainly his um, campaign, but then we also had the Great Depression prohibition, and there was this and sort of combination that's going on. Tell us right. a little bit about that era. Hard, hard living, from what I understand, very hard. Um, um, 
even before the chicken industry got going, I mean, this was, this meaning Delmarva, was an agricultural community, but it was a hard way to make a life. Um, the chicken industry seemed to help and provided even more income than tomatoes, peaches, strawberries, which were also being trucked north. Um, the area was heavily wooded, so pine shavings for um, the chicken houses and also logging um, were very plentiful for a while. Again, it was a hard, hard way to make a life um, in, in agriculture, but there were a few pioneers that were very successful. Um, John Isaacs being one of them, um, he did canning, he had chickens, he did law, he was basically an entrepreneur, did a lot of things. And as I was working on this book, I didn't know anything, I just kind of bumped into him. Um, anyway. And, and so tell me a little more about him, how integral was he then to this, this process? Very, very much a leader, um, and like I said, an entrepreneur. In the Georgetown area, he was the first to refrigerate chicken and freeze it and get it on a car and send it north. Um, but he was also, like I said, into logging. Um, oh, 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 and the best part. Um, he had a canning operation, several um, production facilities, and he had these labels. And that was another thing I just kind of fell over, fell into. He had these canning labels that said John, you know, John Isaacs, Ellendale, Delaware, and then, you know, a picture of very nice illustration of peas or asparagus and then in the background were the cascades and fir trees and i'm going wait a minute there's no mountains in delaware there are no fir trees you have to go to maryland and see loblollies and i thought how? but it, it was probably one of those ideas he sold the canned goods with a gorgeous label now you also have this great story that uh, during the great depression and particularly the um, prohibition era that uh, oh, yeah. they they kind of some some people wanted to hide this stuff, use yes. the chicken houses. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. You well, have a great story it was, there. It was in Delaware Beach Life several years ago. There was a story about the Bunting family. So I contacted the publisher, got a hold of the the authors, and this guy is actually a forensic. Oh shoot, I just lost it. Um, digital forensic something or other, and he uh -huh. travels the world. But anyway, his relatives back in the twenties um, had chickens right there in Bethany Beach, what is now Bethany Beach, and their their home is still there, within like two blocks of the beach. Much like Lewis, back in the day, these so-called beach communities were not places you wanted to live. They had chicken houses, and in Lewis, they had the Otis Smith's Fish Company, PU, you, you know, you didn't want to go there. Well, Bethany was much the same way. The chicken houses were right up to the beach. Long story short, somebody in the family and it didn't come out till decades later stashed liquor again it was a rough way to make a living a lot there was a lot of rum running going on the coast was dark so it was perfect perfect for local fishermen who couldn't fish anymore because the bay had silted up there were no clams there were no oysters but there was liquor and some was being held um, stashed in this chicken house. Well, in the Bunting family, along comes the sheriff. He wanted to get some manure for his garden. So John Bunting goes, go over there, go get it. That that house is empty and needs to get cleaned out. He was very happy somebody would take the manure. So the sheriff comes screaming back, whoa, because there's cases and cases of illegal liquor. Then they start tearing up the floorboards of the house and the, the guy goes, wait a minute, you think if I'm stupid enough to hide liquor in my chicken house, I'm going to send you in there to go, you know, to go get Manure I said, I don't know anything about this. And he said, besides, I don't drink. My wife doesn't allow any liquor in the house. Get out of here. So they eventually figured out, um, decades later, there was a family gathering, and they decided to tell who had, who had placed the liquor there because there were two young guys that ran out, ran away. They never found them. Well, they were um, the cousin and the uncle of this um, Steve Bunting. Mm -hmm. Great story and wonderful photos. I mean, he had a picture of his uncle <coughs> Elias, Christmas, 1944, sitting on the front of a, I think it's a Plymouth, um, with a liquor bottle and a big old, big old cigar. And I just thought, what a family story. And he was so kind. He gave me some neat photos. The photos are in the book. Now, uh, the, the, the broiler industry, as I understand it, really sort of took off uh, with uh, the Second World War and the 40s yes. and so on. Tell me yes. then a little bit about how that expands. Uh, oh, my gosh. Okay, well, it starts with the building of 113 and 
ports developed for shipping food, among other things, um, to the troops in Europe. And what my understanding was, when chickens, again, were going to New York, um, a lot of folks were kind of not very happy for two reasons. One, because the chicken was going to the troops. Two, um, there was some bootlegging going on with the with with even with the chicken and they had to the truckers had to prove that they had you know the chickens were were going to um you know for the troops and not being sold for a high dollar someplace else the other thing that happened was as young men were being shipped overseas um much of the agricultural industry was left without workers and POWs, German POWs were brought in to work not only the fields, but also in some of the chicken processing plants. And thanks to the Delaware archives, um, I was able to, to um, get one of the photos of these guys working. And I also remember, I, my kids grew up in Kentucky, and their great-grandmother had German POWs working in the tobacco fields on her farm, which again, everybody was up in arms about but she had no help you know she didn't it she couldn't help it had to do it and again people here were a little upset that their family members their loved ones are over in europe fighting and yet here we are you know giving these guys jobs well somebody had to do the work um right so the broilers then become a big industry mm -hmm. and in terms of uh expansion i mean but they weren't the broilers that we have in the store now these things if you look at the photo of the of the the german pow um defeathering these birds they look like rats i mean they were the the, the chickens of the 40s were not the chickens that we have now um we've come a long way in terms of feed housing taking good care of them these things were like they were they're skinny and there's not they weren't much meat on them at all so kind of we've scrawny. come a long way baby yep <laughs> it's kind of so and one of the other <clears throat> things that that happens is that we get this sort of vertical integration mm -hmm. tell me a little bit a little bit about that and there was a, a an exchange i guess at one point for some of the farmers of some of the poultry growers and, and but that kind of yes. dissipated with with right. integration how did that okay. in, change the, the in the early days chicken farmers were much like every other farmer very independent they had to buy their own feed they had to truck their birds they had to sell their birds they had to get biddies and they did this all on their own now the poultry exchange right there in selbyville was organized and it, again it started at woody's diner some growers would get together and have coffee kind of like they used to do mm -hmm. and they got to talking and they said look you know we need to help ourselves we need an auction and again much like in kentucky they had tobacco auctions for the same purpose those guys and gals were independent but they figured a way to come together to sell their product well in this case it was chickens what i learned was that about the time that the second third generation of cecil Steele's um grandchildren were coming of age the again this is in the 50s the the vertical integration had just started because the the independent way of doing things was was very fine but not terrifically efficient and as we talked earlier much like everything else in agriculture it's a gamble and the poultry exchange went for a few years it was even on radio and it was very helpful but it was only it was it was the the rear end of the, of the process there needed to be a way to ensure efficiency from beginning to end not just at the end so the whole idea and this came about with the substations and the help of um, Gordy and a couple of other fellows who said look we need to totally align and they call it integration vertical integration but totally align the business and it, as it turned out again in the early days there were many producers they were all there must have been 14 companies now we have five and they're all family run and everybody else kind of went someplace else and by that i mean in other parts of the country and continued with you know big agriculture here it's just chickens and these companies do just chickens whether it's the egg industry or the meat industry and it's like a company store you know they own this much the the grower owns this much and at settlement day, when the birds are sold, that's when the, the grower finds out how much he or she has earned.
In terms of uh, this relationship, I mean, obviously it has the upside of um, at least continuity and some mm -hmm. reliance, right? Stability. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there is a certain dependence, I guess, mm -hmm. as well, that I've, I've heard from some of the mm -hmm. growers. Right. I mean, yep. And the thing is, it, it doesn't matter because they don't have a choice. And what they're what what I've heard um, people saying as advice, and I, and I put it in the book, if if a um, family moves into the area or somebody decides to get into the business, y you need to understand this process and also find a producer willing to work with you. You know, you don't just wake up and go, "I'm going to do this." you need some help and advice. And the neat thing is nowadays, too, um, they have what they call flock supervisors. And mm -hmm. these people are kind of the intermediaries. They give the grower advice. They help. Um, back in the day, they were called zone managers. And, in fact, there's a fellow um, still alive over in um, Ocean View, and he he worked for Paramount. And he was like a... a, a uh, zone seven or something but it was his job he came out of the navy and again uh, in those days there weren't a whole lot of jobs to choose from so he went to work for a um, poultry producer back then and he again they called them zone managers now they call them flock supervisors and they are paid by the producer you know to help growers so they have all the help in the world for either writing grants oh i must say on my way here on 611, I saw for the first time where there had been some abandoned chicken houses. They finally taken them down. There's grant money available to growers or to, I should say, landowners um, where there are abandoned or or um, closed down chicken houses. You can actually get funding available to help with that process. Now, chicken houses obviously have changed over the years, but so have the chickens. What has gone into making them going from, as you do almost described, as kind of scrawny things mm -hmm. out of the 1940s to what we certainly have now. I mean, they're much plumper. They I mean, right. look much different than they did before. The feed is better. Um, there are inoculations um, that happen early on. But I, I do need to say um, there's been a, a movement here lately, no antibiotics ever, to to help the public understand that these birds are not indiscriminately given antibiotics either to keep them alive to make them healthy fat anything else there's n very good technology in um feed production conversion and and a lot some of the growers in here who have come to know or it's like they're scientists they they know exactly how much their birds are eating drinking and they call it conversion in other words food goes in meat comes out um and my hat's off to them because it's a it's a science that is I've read about it and I hear them talk about it, but it's almost beyond my comprehension. In other words, they know exactly what's going on in that chicken house. In terms of the chicken houses, um, obviously they've gotten larger, but uh, one of the things that strikes me, and we don't really think about this, particularly as consumers, is that these chicken houses, the, the chickens have at least some space, and I guess it's yes. been increasing over the, yes. over the years. Yep. It's a square footage, and whether it's an old chicken house and small or a relatively new one and larger, there is a dedicated area square foot per bird that they maintain and one of the gals that i came to know and i respect highly um temple grandin is an animal activist but she also was employed by purdue to judge um a contest where purdue wanted and it, they put it out to their growers to come up with um um architectural uh how do i say remedies to get the birds to move more in other words they all go by the square footage they have to do that but purdue recognized that they wanted to go beyond just food and water they wanted the birds to act more like you know chickens outside so they did this um enrichment design contest they had temple grandin come in and she was one of the judges and a, a family named carpenter down in north carolina um one and they actually called it a carpenter's bench and all they did they have windows like you have here they put a shelf mm -hmm. and a ramp and for a couple of bucks mm -hmm. and it turns out the birds are up and down the ramp they're looking out the window they're jumping off the hay bales but they're moving around there was another um I researcher, I guess you'd call him, that was at a, uh, I was at a um, conference last year, and they're going to do it again, a live production conference in Ocean City. It's a national affair. And this guy was talking about using robots. They're 
their team had developed these drone robot thingies to mm-hmm. kind of move around quietly in the chicken house and just kind of nudge them, not poke them, not scare them to death, but just move around. Also, it has some kind of monitor so they could watch the birds, but the idea was this thing would keep everybody moving. Now, I don't know anybody who has one. I like the idea of a ramp and, you know, something to jump off a little bit better. So in terms, by the way, of the new chicken house, one of the things, the issues obviously has come up is that compared to the small ones, I mean, there's some pretty large ones. I remember talking to somebody down in Somerset County. Mm-hmm. And one of the issues that has arisen, right, has been that uh, it's not a matter of not having the large chicken houses, which obviously are probably much more economical in terms of efficiency. Mm-hmm. But it's a placement issue that, that you know, where right. are you going to place them? Because they right. were like, in the Somerset case, for example, there was a, a development that had been there for some 20 years. And then they came in and built this large operation, and it created these issues. What 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 well, sense you get about all of that? There's I mean, two, there's two sides, and I learned one when I was working on flying over Delmarva. There's the Right to Farm Act, which right. has been around for a long time. Here's the farmer. Maybe this farm over here gets sold because the kids don't want to farm, so they sell it to a developer, and the developer puts up houses. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. Those folks have no right to tell. The, the existing farm, what's going on. And I'll tell you, I did a book signing in Rehoboth um, a couple years ago, flying over Delmarva, and I was pretty excited about it. I walked in my little flight suit, and, 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 and <laughs> this lady came specifically to the bookstore to yell at me because the spray planes were waking her up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, what? Okay, I get it. My point is, whether it be mm-hmm. the, the chicken house is there first and then the development comes in or the development's there and then, like you said, perhaps this land is sold and somebody puts up a brand new chicken house, yes, then there's trouble. But what DCA, the, the Delmarva Chicken Association, is trying to help growers understand is that there are policies, there's grant money to... Um, keep your neighbors happy and (laughs) with the tunnel fans blowing out the air dust feathers there's all kinds of um design um my brain just quit buffers to to put in place to catch the feathers kept the kept you know catch the dust reduce the noise so that the neighbors are not affected and those are can do things they work well, what kind of things constitute uh, the buffers? What do they put in those buffers? It's a combination of um, mesquites grass, the big tall, looks like uh, Phragmites, big tall grass, mm-hmm. trees, shrubs, um, and even pollinators. Because what they're finding now is that the pollinators, the black-eyed Susans and all the other um, flowering bushes, um, bring bees, which we need, but also... Mm-hmm. Um, they're nice to look at. I mean, it's not, <laughs> you can't just put up a wall. Um, but the 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 and there's a toolkit, a vegetative environmental buffer toolkit that DCA offers to growers to help them um, not just design something that'll work on their property, but also be able to fund it. Now, you obviously you you focus a lot on a lot of the local folks, and we'll get there in a moment. But one of the things that struck me, and as particularly when it came to large chicken houses, but I'm sure it's elsewhere, is that there are people who come in from outside and invest in these chicken houses, large mm-hmm. chicken houses, mm-hmm. but they don't really have any local roots. I mean, is that right. do we see more investment from outside yeah. uh, than you know? Or I, is it pretty I, still local? The folks that I dealt with in this book, again, I met through DCA. Um, it's a combination of, and, and I group them kind of accordingly, from folks who have come in from the outside, who have like, they started out as taxi drivers in New York or working for an airline in Korea. They come here and they become chicken farmers. Or there are folks who grow up in the business, their family, and they're you know well-established, they're here. And then sometimes it's just somebody comes out of the service and says, I'm going to do this now, and they do it. Now, they're from here, but they didn't grow up in the industry. As far as big chicken houses run by corporations, let's say, I hate to say this, but in China or some other place, that I don't know about. And I'm honestly saying that I can't talk about because I don't know about it. So I want to talk then a little bit about some of the folks um, that you uh, talk about. One, I guess, uh, David Lovell, I guess, um, he has... uh, and once promotes environmental practices right. and has been trying to work with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, right. which is sort of an interesting combination. Tell me a little right. bit about he him. He was a kid, and I've not met him. I just read about him. All the growers at one point were deemed outstanding growers by 
Delmarva um, Chicken Association. He, in the Melfa area, grew up basically crabbing and raising chickens and corn all at the same time. He'd get off the tractor and go do this, or get off the tractor and get on the boat. So for him, it was not, it wasn't a discontinuity to, to be able to do both. In other words, he didn't view chicken farmers as polluting the bay, or he didn't, you know, it, it, it was a, it, it went together. He grew up that way. So, you know, naturally he wants to help and also wants to be able to participate in the industry in a way that it's good for local l local waters, whether it's the Chesapeake Bay or Delaware Bay. Um, and he's working on that. The other thing, uh, I guess Andrew McLean, he uh, mm -hmm. talked about best practices, mm -hmm. financing and best practices. Mm -hmm. And obviously we've had a number of restrictions have been placed not only by the state, but also locally in terms of the counties. Tell me a little bit about him and that effort to try to like get a handle on some of the issues that uh, face these communities. Well, again, working, you know, starting out in school and, and learning, you know, learning some of the issues and, and grappling with them. He goes, well, I'm going to do it. And so instead of just talking about it, um, he is a grower and also speaks and so and it helps because of you know many of the the farmers that i came upon they're like other kinds of farmers they don't talk publicly they don't even like they even want to talk to me but and it's hard for them you know they're much more comfortable either out on the tractor or um you know in the chicken house yeah. so it, it it was very nice to be able to you know to meet not maybe technically meet, but work with, talk to, write about some of these people who are willing to put themselves out and, and not only do it, but, but talk about it. The other name is Isabella Rossellini. Yes. Tell me oh, about that. I, I, I ran across, I said, really? Yeah, that was one of those things that just plopped in my lap. And, you know, there were times when it was hard and I think, why am I doing this? Well, because these things... Anyway, there was a magazine a friend of mine in Oregon sent to me, and she helped edit a couple of the projects I've worked on. The magazine doesn't even exist anymore, but the article was on Rosa, 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 I can't even talk. Rosalini, yes. Isabella Rosalini, who's the daughter of the actress and the director, and she lives on Long Island and has for quite some time. Um, lived in Spain for quite some time in a very agricultural area and when she basically retired a little bit from acting and modeling she has this home on Long Island well the story was that uh, right around the corner from her there was a parcel of land that a developer was very interested in we've all heard that story and she yeah. goes uh uh so she bought it up she goes I'm going to be a farmer okay fine I'm going to have chickens oh you are okay so she orders much like um, Cecil Steele, she orders chickens, again, from the same hatchery I work out of, Murray McMurray out of Iowa. They send her chicks, and she goes, oh, they're not yellow. What? What's going on here? Well, she had, it wasn't their fault. She must have ordered a straight run, mixed breed, heavy breed, whatever. So she gets this kind of explosion of color, and she goes, oh, wow, these are not yellow. <laughs> so she has a friend of hers, a guy named um, Casanova, come, Patrice Casanova, he's a photographer, fashion photographer he comes every maybe week or so photographing these birds and she's handling them and the photo in the magazine is of her leaning over with one of her hens on her shoulder in her house and she calls this particular hen um who's the female aviator um uh, um, uh, Amelia. Yeah. She calls this particular hen Amelia because this hen is very brave. Well, anyway, so she's in her house. I'm going, in your house? So the chickens grow, and then she realizes she has half roosters and half hens. And she goes, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, you did. It's not their fault. <laughs> so, and then she goes on and she goes, oh, well, sometimes there's death on the farm, meaning, you know, she got rid of the roosters because they basically were tearing up the hens. I thought, I like this lady. Well, as it turned out, before she bought the land and got the chickens, she had was completing a degree in animal biology, some local college, master's degree. And I thought, well, good for her. And she fell in love with Darwin. So she's watching, you know, all of this go on with her chickens. And then she had a couple words to say about, you know, the, the commercial industry and how maybe they need to start to include some of the heritage breeds um, in with, you know, the Cornish cross that we usually see. But I thought, neat lady. So as the books were done before this one, I sent them, you know, to an address. I don't know if she got them. But I told her, I said, we use the same um, hatchery. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
speaking of books, this is actually the third. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about the other two books briefly. Okay. This one, Chickens on Delmarva, I actually started several years ago. In fact, right after flying over Delmarva. But, like I said, I had a couple of hiccups, as they call it, with publishers. Yep. And while things were happening, um, I thought, well, i got to do something. So I did the ABC book, and there was a um, gal who's a principal in Frankfurt. She translated it for me in Spanish because, because many of the workers who are in the chicken houses here on Delmarva are from Central South America and Mexico, and a lot of them don't speak a whole lot of English. So I had it translated into Spanish. Again, I'm still waiting, working on Chickens on Del Marva, and finally, the gal who was the first editor, my friend in Oregon, she said, Joanne, stop. No more growers. Okay, so I have 35 growers that are right. She goes, stop. No more. Okay, fine. <laughs> so we're still dinging around, we're, you know, trying to find a publisher. Meanwhile, a friend from high school helped me publish Chickens on Del Marva A to Z, which is a spiral bound. It's a manual for kids in FFA and 4-H. It's an illustrated dictionary of all the breeds here on Del Marva. And basically, I got a lot of help from Delaware State Fair folks um, and put together this manual for kids who, who have chickens as their club project. Now, it got done... I still am without a publisher for Chickens on Del Marva, so I asked my friend from high school, I said, would you do this for me? I said, it's a lot more work than these other two, a lot more technical, a lot more science. I said, I don't think we can afford a hardback book, but I want it done like Flying Over Del Marva. And he said, sure. So one last thing. While he's putting the book together, I have my hip replaced. He gets cancer, and he's going through chemo, radiation. Mm. I'm thinking... This isn't going to happen. This book, we're, it's, no. Finally, we both climb out of it, and it's marvelous. He did such a wonderful job. He really did. And I'll see him in a couple of weeks. We have a high school reunion coming up. And finally, of course, there's the Chicken Festival that's coming up. Oh, yes, up, yes. Which, Thank you. Um, yes. Yes. October 7, um, Delmarva Chicken Association, DCA, is hosting a chicken festival right here in Salisbury at Purdue Stadium. It's October 7, Saturday. It's free. It's from 12 to 7. There will be food, games, and I've got a couple art things going on, some historical exhibits, lots of things to look at and do, fun for kids. And it's to celebrate, of course, Cecil Steele, her 100-year anniversary, but also 75 years of DCA, formerly DPI. This is their 75th year as a nonprofit organization striving to help the growers here on Delmarva. We've been speaking with Joanne Guilfoy. She's written a new book entitled Chickens on Delmarva, 100 Years of Backyard Flocks, Farms, and Friends. Appreciate you stopping by and chatting with us. Thank you for having me. You're listening to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Delmarva Today with Don Rush.